Taste Holdings has announced that Brimstone Investment Corporation has agreed to subscribe for 24 million of its ordinary shares at a price of 1 rand 54 per share, resulting in an aggregate subscription price of 36 million rand. The vendor consideration will be used by Taste to partially fund its acquisition of the fish and chip company. Brimstone will hold 12.4% of the Taste ordinary shares in Isu. Chris, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. Brimstone is a black controlled and managed investment company, right. so this investment will significantly increase Taste's uh, level of black ownership. But yes. the Board of Taste has also been invited to um, nominate a member of Brimstone to the board. And yes. I just want to touch on some of the other intricacies of this deal with Brimstone. Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, in, in a sense, this is a it looks, certainly looks to me like a partnership arrangement rather than um, a, a necessarily a takeover. Um, it, it's, I, I think each, each company is looking at it. Uh, there's a mutual, benefic mutual benefit that they are looking for in this thing. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Taste is an interesting addition to, to the Brimstone um, uh, investment suite as well. Um, uh, it, it, it broadens their, their, their footprint and horizon in, in, in terms of sectors. Um, you know, clearly um, it's not something that, that they can just go in without some re reciprocal expertise mm -hmm. that they need. And that's why I think there's a more mutual arrangement here. So it looks very pragmatic, uh, for, you, you know, from that point of view. Um, I think, um, you, you know, Taste itself is looking at acquisitions. Um, and, and I think so. It, it's a case of there's a knock-on um, that this deal really helps to facilitate the the, 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 the next deal. And, and Taste is in quite a competitive space, and um, to, being able to add brands to its f f footprint is important. The, the fish and chips is, is a is a relatively new brand that's asserting itself quite nicely. Well, I, I want to touch on that, Chris, because yeah. they're saying that with this acquisition of the fish and chip company, they're going to be targeting the lower LSM. But when I think yeah. Lower LSM, the last association would be fish. It's normally pies or chicken. Yeah, exactly. What is the rationale of this acquisition, and what will the well, impact be on taste earnings? Well, funny enough, fish and chips has been a staple of, um, you could say, the working man. Um, it, it certainly is the case in the UK, um, and um, we've we largely have lost the fish and chips in a sense, and that's coming back. The fish and chips brand is bringing back that 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 really very staple meal, um, uh, easy meal, uh, it, it's, it's quite popular and, and, and that sort of thing and, and I think it gives people a variety away from chicken um, because there's really that, that market is very, saturated. very well traded and, mm -hmm. and saturated and there may well be growth in that, that sector but this, is, this helps to look for a new um, uh, how can I say, dimension, a new, new part of that wallet, that, that consu consumption wallet. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in the sense that you get um, a, 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 a quite a good deal, of, a, a substantial meal at the fish and chips company for what you're paying, it's very competitive from that point of view. And that's why I think it's making inroads. Let's bring in Craig into the conversation now in Cape Town. Craig, I want to touch on the uh, value proposition of taste relative to other <coughs> companies such as Famous Brands and Spur. They certainly don't have the brand power of Famous Brands or the balance sheet strength. So to what extent does the jewelry franchising strengthen the traditional food core for taste? Well, look, most of the acquisitions of late have been in the food area, and of course, when they acquired jewellery, it did uh, perhaps raise a few questions in terms of whether they're diversifying from their core strategy. But I think what they've indicated is um, they're really in franchising. And what's interesting about jewellery is, of course, you've got the manufacturing side and the retail side to it as well, and although they are fran you know, using the franchise model, um, it, it, it does work for them because it's a slightly different sector, you get different types of growth, perhaps um, uh, a bit more buoyant in, in, in good times. But um, I like the acquisitions that they've made in the food space. When they made St. Elmo's, I think they, 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 they got it for a real steal. That's proved to be a good investment, um, about 65 million for, for, for the Fish and Chip Co. And I think what's nice about it is although there's 170 uh, franchises or outlets, they're mostly in the Gauteng area. So there's really the, the rest of, the, of uh, South Africa to, to, to focus on. And um, a lot of growth because 320, 330 outlets as opposed to over 2,000 outlets on famous brands, it's really a, a growth story. And let's face it, um, South Africans are spending 
on takeaways and fast foods and uh, we can see that from the growth that's been experienced in famous brands. Mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, it'll only get better for, for taste going forward. From a valuation point of view, they certainly uh, look good. I think that's why Brimstone have, have invested in them and, and other prudent capital managers such as Risi M Caliber have also put some money towards taste at much lower levels but obviously expressing confidence in the growth story. So staying with the topic of the outlets that Craig mentioned, Scooter's Pizza is the fastest growing pizza delivery chain in South Africa with over 140 stores. And they've been saying that they've been opening a new store every 28 days. So it looks like it's global domination by pizza. But <laughs> let's touch on the sustainability of a capital investment yeah. strategy that's centered on opening stores. No, uh, clearly one can get to saturation. Um, I, I don't think taste is anywhere near that. But one's got to be careful of um, overextending oneself. Look, in the franchising business, the, the one thing you can't do is have a single store in a single place. Uh, the, 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 the distribution and servicing is then not feasible. You actually need almost a burst of, of opening stores so that you've got a decent footprint for your distribution. Um, uh, the, the, and that's, that's quite important. Um, and, and I think they're trying to achieve that. Um, it can go too quickly. But I think that the Scooters brand is, uh, has taken off quite well. Um, and um, they, they, as I say, they're competing in a space which is sort of just a little bit outside where, where famous brands and Spurs sort of uh, operating in. And I think, that, um, you know, from that point of view, they actually, um, they, they probably can sustain the growth. But to generate growth, you need the balance sheet and that's the one thing missing in taste and that's why the brimstone investment becomes quite crucial in the gr growth. It's actually a lesson, if, if I could just do a little diversity, is that Very the quickly, though, balance please. sheet is what drives growth, not profitability and that should apply in economic principles as well. So would you say it's a hot stop oh, or yes, not? It's, it's, it's hot, but there is going to be balance sheet constraints that need to be unlocked to get that growth going. Hot, but there will be balance sheet constraints to get the growth going. Craig in Cape Town, give us your vote and tell us if it's a hot stock or not. And just relative to other small cap stocks, would you say that Taste is still a darling? I mean, they've got decent operating margins, decent cash flow, obviously lacking that uh, cash balance that uh, Chris alluded to. But how do you feel about them generally relative to other small caps? I think this is actually the third time that I've discussed them on the show. On the first two <laughs> occasions they were sitting at around 50, 55 cents and that was sizzling hot then. Um, I still think that there's a, a long-term growth story and it's hot and relative to, to other retailers, um, I think there's a lot of, lot of value here. Yeah, the retail sector has just moved tremendously and if you actually look at famous brands, it's been relatively flat while tasters has grown, so hot for me. Hot for Craig too. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's move on now. Diversified financial services group Sunlum achieved satisfactory results for the 10 months ended 31 October. New life insurance business volumes were up 23% and net fund inflows of 19 billion rand were reported. 600 million rand of discretionary capital was utilized in respect of strategic acquisitions, including the acquisition of 3 million Suntum shares and Sunlum private investments acquisition of majority stakes in merchant securities in the United Kingdom and Summit Trust in Switzerland. Chris, I want mm. to start with the uh, company's capital adequacy requirements. Yes. They're saying that they are already well capitalized and at the mm. end of uh, June 2011, they had discretionary capital of 3.2 billion rand. They added a further 700 million rand of additional capital yeah. through a number of disposals. Um, given the fact that they're already so well capitalized and the 3.2 times cover, is it really being prudent on the part of Sunlam or is it just business as usual? I think this is more a business as usual type of company in any case, and I think that's the that's where I think we need to to tilt as far as that one is concerned. Um, that they, they they do have a reasonably strong balance sheet and and quite a bit of ammunition, if you like, that they can actually use. Um, but it's a it's a solid company. It's um, it's well established. It's got brand parts, got the whole, but it's also got an element of stodge. Um, in, in this, and this is the problem with the life assurance industry as a whole. Um, I, I think there is grounds for, 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 for um, 21st century products that can still come out of this industry, etc., but it still has to come out. Um, and um, th and that's what, what worries me about this sector, is, the, is that um, if, if Granny had it in her portfolio for the dividends and that sort of thing, I think she can keep it. 
uh, you know, because I think there will be reasonable, you know, yield, and it's, it'll be fairly secure and that that kind of thing. It's it's basically the where does the growth come mm -hmm. from? Okay. In other words, they're they're looking in Switzerland, they're looking in London, etc. Et but I just think South African companies trying to make headway in those kind of markets, you need very deep pockets, and their pockets are not deep enough to tackle it. Old mutual battled. It should never have gone there. They should have rather been looking at maybe Africa or India or Brazil or something like that. But other emerging markets, I think, would have been a better uh, strategy than trying to you know, go for something in Switzerland and the UK. Well, Craig, they are mentioning talks of uh, going into India with Shuram Capital and they're going to get a 26% interest in Shuram and they're going to be paying 1.9 billion rand for this. New business is expected to grow by 20%, but um, what sort of returns can Sunlam expect from the Shuram investment in India? Look, I think um, India is a, is a market that's on the radar screens of many um, insurance companies. And the problem with uh, growing on the continent of Africa is that uh, the profile of the client is, is, is quite a lot different. I mean, they've done fairly well in Botswana, but you can see that's reaching maturity. And in fact, I think they still achieved 30% growth on the African continent, mm -hmm. but it's not an easy market uh, and, and you mm -hmm. can't just enter every country. So, so of course, the other emerging market uh, aspect is, is India, which is attractive. And I think there could potentially be quite a lot of growth. I don't know how that will translate into the, um, the income statement with, uh, with them only having a 26% shareholding there. But um, from, from a... From an uh, investment point of view, they're obviously positioning themselves for growth. I, I also s seem to share Chris's views in terms of perhaps uh, entering the, the UK and Switzerland right now isn't the best route to, to take. Um, but um, they're sitting on capital. They've increased their shareholding in Suntum to about 60%. We're mm -hmm. not sure what they're going to do with that asset. But um, really holding a lot of, a lot of um, investments. Mm -hmm. And I'm only really expecting uh, below two-digit growth from them uh, over the short term. Well, Craig, just staying with you, Sunlam Emerging Markets reported growth of 9% um, in new business volumes for the first 10 months of uh, 2011. But Sunlam UK increased its new life business volumes by more than 30%. Now, given the challenges in the UK, are we attributing this to the large annuity business mandate or what else is behind this phenomenal growth in the UK? Well, I can answer to, to, to an extent. Um, I, I suspect they've got quite a, uh, it's basically amounts to what investment they've put into the marketing side of it and to what extent they're able to hook customers. Obviously, 30% growth is, is not too bad, but it's not a significant part of their business. It's not as if that you 30% know, growth translates back to South Africa as very, very little uh, in, in the overall scheme of things. Um, because the rump of their business still is in South Africa mm. and it must still seem as basically a South African company with most of its business interests in South Africa. Um, and uh, so, so growth offshore is very welcome. It's like Botswana growth, you know, also 30% or whatever the case might be. Um, it's not very big, <laughs> right? And that's, that's what needs to happen. They need to actually get into a more sizable market. My sense is they need to look at another country, not not quite like Indian, and I know I said Brazil earlier, but I think they need to look at it, another country like South Africa, uh, like a Turkey or a Colombia. That well, they're kind mentioning of going market. into Mozambique by yeah, the end Mozambique of this financial like year, as well as Swan. Southeast Asia. They've got like plans to expand to Southeast Asia Southeast too. Southeast Asia is great if you can look at a market that is similar to South Africa's. Right, in, in a sense that you're not trying to take on bigger, more powerful players, that you can actually match them and you can capitalize it adequately. Craig, let's get your sense now on their ongoing relationship with Santam and what you anticipated to be. They bought back 3 million shares in Santam and they sold their interest in my way to Santam. The 59% stake in Santam compensating for the dilution in Sun Lam's short-term insurance exposure. What do you anticipate the relationship to be with the short-term insurer for Sun Lam? Well, look, I think that some, some years ago there was a talk about uh, totally unbalancing and selling that asset. It didn't come to fu fruition. But mm -hmm. what's happening is Suntum is feeding uh, Sunlam with uh, great cash flows at the moment. I, I, I don't think there's been any indication to market that they want to increase that shareholding substantially. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously they're sitting with cash that they don't know what to do. So I don't see any reason for them to get rid of Suntum in the short term because, again, they've got to find a home for, 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 for that money. 
But uh, as, as Chris alluded to, from the point of holding on to it, expecting some growth in dividends and the fact that there are good cash flows in the underlying businesses as well as mm. uh, uh, Sunnam, it, uh, it wouldn't be wrong holding it. But that doesn't really excite me no. as, a, as, a, as an investment potential and yeah. as a growth story. And so Sunlam sounding like it's not too hot for you, Craig, in Cape Town? My, my, my preference would probably be Liberty in terms of current valuations and expected growth, so not, mm. not hot. Not hot uh, for Craig. Liberty is his yeah. preference in terms of current valuations. Chris, how do you feel about Sunlam? Yeah, hot or not? It's not hot, lukewarm at best, but it's not a bad company. That's the point, is that the Sunlam goes through bursts and times where it actually shows innovation and, and then it dies again and, and that kind of thing. It's one of those that can perk up and then, then let's face it, on a share price point of view, compared to Old Mutual since the, you know, the, 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 um, the, their listings, some of them has done better. Mm. So it's just simple as that. And it's seen as a more staid sort of study, but it's done better than, than Old Mutual.